So first of all, let me thank you, Anantha, um, both for the introduction, but more importantly, for everything you've done to bring us to this point today, uh, particularly for your leadership and your collaborative spirit in bringing the MIT intelligence quest to reality. We owe a great debt to you, Anantha. Thank you. My principal responsibility this morning is to introduce our next speaker. David Siegel is a computer scientist, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He co-founded Two Sigma Investments, where he currently serves as co-chairman. David received his undergraduate degree from Princeton and his PhD from MIT, where he conducted his doctoral work in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. In 2001, he co-founded Two Sigma on the belief that innovative technology and data science could help discover value in the world's data. Today, through the use of algorithms with its unique culture, Two Sigma drives transformation in many industries, including investment management and insurance. As of 2018, the firm manages over $52 billion in assets, with more than 1,400 employees across offices in New York, Houston, London, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. David's philanthropic efforts underscore his conviction that education, science, and technology are keys to a better world. He sits on the board of organizations which promote his convictions, including the MIT Corporation, Carnegie Hall, and the Scratch Foundation, which he co-founded. Before I turn over the podium to David, I would be remiss if I did not thank him. David was one of our earliest thought partners on the intelligence quest. We solicited his opinion and input when, when it was still just an idea in its formative stages. We sent him documents, talked on the phone, put him in touch with more people from MIT who could answer questions that we couldn't. He was curious, tireless, and a diligent partner in this exercise, and for that we're truly grateful. David's perspective as an industry leader at Two Sigma gave MIT crucial inputs at a time when they were most needed, at a moment when they could, could have the greatest impact on the quest direction. Our faculty, many of whom Anantha acknowledged, were also consulted extensively and contributed significantly, but David brought a unique and valuable perspective. I feel very confident that the MIT Intelligence Quest will have tremendous impact here and around the world, and this success will no doubt have been influenced by David's guidance. So thank you, David, and let, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Good morning, and uh, first let me thank you, Marty, for those remarkably kind words. Uh, uh, I really very much appreciate uh, 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 the introduction, and I have to reciprocate and tell you how wonderful it was working with the entire team putting together the MIT IQ project. Uh, for me, it was nothing but a total pleasure. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being here on such an incredible day, the launch of MIT IQ. Uh, before I uh, talk uh, more about the effort, uh, I want to mention that 30, about 35 years ago today, I was standing on this very stage talking, of all things, about the uh, uh, accuracy of invariant moment analysis in computer vision systems. I was a sophomore uh, junior at Princeton, and I had a paper accepted at an ASME conference, which was being held right here in Kresge Auditorium. And uh, uh, it was the very first conference talk that I ever gave. And the stage is actually no different. What I remember most about when I gave that talk was, number one, the bright lights would shine right in your face, and you can't see anyone in the auditorium. And number two, it's an awfully big room filled with you know, very, very smart people, which is actually quite intimidating. So my first conference talk you know, scared me incredibly. And I have to tell you, I don't feel really any different today. <laughs> but in any case, it is great to be back here 
uh, once again talking about intelligence, artificial and natural. I believe that nothing in the universe is, in the end, more complex than the human mind. From the start of our history, we have been trying to grasp how the mind gives rise to intelligence. This is not a new question. We do this and we think about this for the very same reasons that we think about the origins of our universe and why we want to understand uh, where all of, all of this came from. It is an equally important question to understand where our mind has come from. Great thinkers through the ages have wrestled with this question. Plato, Descartes, Kant, and the like used philosophy as a starting point. Uh, others pursued a more spiritual approach. In modern times, psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists have applied the tools of the scientific method to understanding the problem of the mind. At the dawn of the computing age, computer scientists immediately, it was one of the first things that computer scientists became interested in, saw the potential for creating artificial intelligence. The field is as new or even predates computing. MIT was one of the pioneering institutions in establishing this field. Advances in AI, like deep learning, have produced remarkably significant breakthroughs. These approaches are phenomenally adept at finding patterns in large data sets and then applying them in useful ways. However, I do not believe this is intelligence in any meaningful sense of the word. Neural networks have interesting and important applications, but they still far, fall far short of the human mind's ability to think. Deep learning can identify faces better than a parent. Remarkable. But we still can't replicate the way a child learns. There are so many basic questions about intelligence that we just can't answer. And I believe that focusing too heavily on what has been called AI may actually be confusing things. For example, what do we really mean by artificial? How is artificial intelligence different from natural intelligence? Is there just one notion of intelligence that can be implemented in different ways? For all of our efforts to date, we have yet to crack the code of intelligence. We may have focused too narrowly on machine learning and AI, and AI, traditional AI approaches, in search of answers. That's, there's a good reason why this effort is not called MIT AIQ. To truly understand intelligence, I believe we need to get back to basics. Cross-disciplinary science framed in engineering terms. This is what we'll do in the MIT IQ core. By combining neuro, cognitive, and computer science, I believe we have the best hope of making the progress that we seek. And now is the time to embark on this mission. Significant advances are already being made at the MIT Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, CSAIL, and elsewhere, both at the Institute and around the world. Industry is investing heavily in so-called AI, but they are not so well equipped to make breakthroughs in, in fundamental questions of the science of intelligence. MIT is. And if we follow this course, I think at least some important answers are well within our reach. I be believe we are likely to see breakthroughs that will help us build a better world. We will have a greater understanding of who we are and how we operate. And we'll understand the social and ethical implications of technology better so that we can help shape public policy. Of course, these are very ambitious goals, but 
MIT does very ambitious things. Speaking very personally, my interest in understanding intelligence goes back quite far, even before I was on the stage here 35 years ago. As for many people I've learned, it started when I saw the film 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time as a very young kid. From then on, I had a real passion for building machines that could behave like humans. Later, I learned to program on a supercomputer when I was only about nine years old, 1970, in the basement of New York University where my mom had received her PhD in mathematics. Ultimately, as some of you know, I arrived at the AI lab here at 545 Tech Square in, 19, in 1983. I was lucky enough to work in the presence of pioneers like Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. Incredible things were happening at the lab. Tech Square housed not only Minsky, but many other innovative teams. Collectively, they developed much of the computer technology that we use every day today. Project Mac was a precursor to distributed computing. The open source movement largely came from that building. Many of the building blocks of the internet were developed there. Of course, RSA encryption and the foundations of AI and robotics. At TechSquare, I was also one of the first recipients of the very first computer virus, the SendMail worm. For those of you who remember SendMail, by the way, you'll understand how hard it was to distinguish this worm from the constant bugs and glitches that normally plagued SendMail. I'll point out that the worm actually originated a mile down Mass Ave at Harvard. At the AI lab, I focused on the development of the Utah MIT dexterous hand. It served as a test bed for the design of control systems, tactile sensing, and other technologies. But what inspired me the most was the innovation happening in that building. It was a challenging and collaborative culture. It was a wellspring of scientific progress. I saw that a small group of unconventional thinkers, given the right environment, the right culture, could ultimately help to transform the world. Years later, I would use TechSquare's culture as a model for the company I co-founded, Two Sigma. TechSquare taught me an awful lot about innovation. To innovate, you cannot have an overly constrained environment. You can't put time limits on the problem because that implies you already know the answer. That's one reason why it took me eight years to finish my PhD, and now would be an appropriate time to thank MIT for not kicking me out any sooner. <laughs> Finally, you can't make progress in isolation. You need to be around smart people who, t might, who, will, who will tell you what you're doing wrong, who will push you to think differently, and people who have diverse skills. That was, and still is, and always will be the MIT way. The atmosphere at Tech Square was truly entrepreneurial. That was the vision that brought me to MIT in the first place, and this is the vision MIT is building on and expanding with its intelligent quest. We have seen this approach work across many different labs and projects at MIT. Just to give you one success story, which I briefly mentioned earlier, the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. CBMM brings together computer, cognitive, and neuroscientists to work in close collaboration. To further our understanding of intelligence and through interdisciplinary efforts in science and engineering. CSAIL, of course, is another example. With its roots in LCS and the AI lab, CSAIL has leveraged deep, fundamental research to deliver hundreds of innovative discoveries in computer science and artificial intelligence. MIT has been a leader in extending the benefits of cutting-edge basic research into the world, in making sure that its research has real impact. Within IQ, the bridge will be poised to link research assets with state-of-the-art AI tools throughout the university and beyond. 
Imagine a future where we can use a deeper grasp of the mind to build more intelligent and useful machines. Imagine a future where we use our new knowledge and our new technologies for the benefit of all, for the benefit of our nation and the benefit of the world. Truly understanding intelligence is, of course, a daunting task. But if there is a place to embark upon this quest, it is here at MIT, where 60 faculty and staff and 29 alumni have won the Nobel Prize. Five have won the Pulitzer Prize. 11 have won the Turing Award. 41, five of whom we'll hear from today, have won the MacArthur Genius Grant. MIT is the place for this endeavor. We simply have the best combination of science plus engineering in the world. And we already have over 200 investigators working directly on the science and engineering of intelligence. We won't have all the answers, of course, in five or 10 years, or maybe even our lifetimes. But even modest progress in this quest will provide enormous benefits to society. We have been trying to understand the origin of the universe since the dawn of history. And we have been on a quest to understand how the mind works for just as long. It's a quest to understand basic deep truths about who we are. And I believe it is the very need to understand ourselves that makes us human. The time to start is now. The objectives of MIT IQ are tremendously ambitious. But given MIT's long history of tackling big problems, we must do this. After all, if not us, who will? Thank you very much. <laughs>